All right, well, good morning and welcome. Uh, this presentation uh, covers floodplain management strategies for um, a, a large industrial uh, redevelopment, uh, primarily focusing on a county roadway project that's using low impact development uh, to meet detention requirements. Uh, my company is Water Earth. We're a water resources and green infrastructure firm. Uh, I'm Jennifer Walker. Uh, if you've got questions after the uh, presentation, you're more than welcome to touch base with me. I will ask you to hold your questions to the end. I have a lot of slides. Uh, I promise there will be time for questions at the end, uh, but this way we'll get through everything. Right, so Holder Eath Road falls within Harris County Industrial District number 17. Um, which uh, previously was um, an Exxon site um, and had oil and gas facilities as well as saltwater uh, injection facilities. And the overall plan for it is to um, provide uh, regional detention to serve the district and also to serve upstream area within the Willow Creek and M124 watersheds. It's located in northern Harris County um, near uh, city of Tomball. Uh, there's an initial phase that includes mitigation um, uh, of some floodplain fill as, as well as initial uh, regional detention. Uh, but primarily we're going to focus on uh, Holder Eath Road, uh, which is the orange road running through there. And then you can see a, a dashed area uh, where some floodplain fill uh, is occurring. Uh, detention ca capacity was reserved in the regional detention basin uh, for Holder Eath um, in the event that it was needed, uh, but it does look like uh, we're able to mitigate uh, impacts using low impact development. Uh, the county is just in the process of choosing which alternative um, they're likely going to go with. Uh, the red dotted areas are the detention service areas uh, and um, detentions also be pro being provided for areas outside the district. Um, M124 is a natural channel. It's being improved and deepened. And as part of that, uh, we're working to meet Army Corps stream mitigation requirements with a natural uh, bench section. Uh, so a detailed hydraulic analysis um, was done um, to be able to essentially contain most of the 100-year event within banks. Uh, there are areas near the mouth of M124 where it's um, dominated by backwater effects from Willow Creek. Those areas are primarily detention anyway, so the, they're not um, being removed from the floodplain. Uh, but there is some isolated floodplain fill uh, occurring that needs to be mitigated. Um, this is an example of what the stream mitigation section looks like. The final section that we've modeled is a little bit different than this, but bench sections, riparian corridors, um, vegetation uh, with Manning's in values reflecting that. Um, so just uh, briefly, so the um, existing uh, M124 channels shown in pink uh, the proposed bench section shown in black, uh, culvert crossing uh, at uh, Holder Eath Road, an impacts analysis was performed to show no, to show no impacts. Um, there's another part of the project on the, on the eastern edge uh, is uh, another roadway. It's called Neighbors Parkway, and it has an associated um, area draining to it. It's almost a mini uh, regional detention area, if you will, uh, and it drains to the M125 watershed. Uh, but we won't focus on that in this particular um, presentation. But there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of players um, on the project, developers, Harris County, um, other um, private um, firms that have purchased some of the land from the developer. So many uh, moving parts. Um, so it's located in a fairly um, uh, undeveloped portion of the county at this point, but a lot of growth going on in the watershed. And so again, even though it, it was previously an Exxon site, it wasn't like it was an extremely developed site. It's just that there were oil um, and gas facilities. Uh, Holder Eath Road is, is shown, the right of way show, is shown there in black. And you can see on the eastern side, it's actually proposed to cross through a flood control um, regional detention basin. There's already an existing gravel road there, so the right of way is following that current path. Um, so 
pretty significantly um, in the floodplain. There is a portion within the M124 um, floodplain, which is um, kind of the north-south uh, channel, and that will be end up being out of the floodplain when the channel improvements are done, except for, of course, the crossings within the stream itself. Uh, the other portion uh, falls within the Willow Creek floodplain, and floodplain storage um, is being accommodated for that. Um, we'll talk later on about whether or not the road's being elevated uh, above the floodplain. Uh, there's also a portion of uh, the road to the east that clips the floodway, uh, and we'll talk about that later as well. Um, so in some areas, there, there's some actually some hills and some topographic relief within the project, but there's also a lot of fairly <coughs> flat areas. It's very densely treed. Um, survey has not yet been obtained for the entire district so there, there's a lot of digging into details um, to figure out which way um, flows drain specifically between the m124 and m125 watersheds and this just gives you a context of how it fits within the uh, effective uh, watersheds uh, one of the key issues on the project was a significant amount of off-site flow um, potentially um, crossing the road uh, alignment. There's three main areas. The area in red um, was, was eventually determined that any, any off-site flow from that would be picked up by the, uh, the neighbor's parkway system, which was the, the system draining a different roadway on the eastern side. And that has subsequently been the case as we've done the analysis with that. So that, that eliminated the need for many, many, many cross culverts to uh, maintain that conveyance capacity or a very large swell. The gold middle area it was determined would be, um, if intercepted, it would be handled by uh, a county uh, facility that's being constructed. Um, a lot of that actually makes its way more directly to M124 uh, than necessarily um, draining through the dashed area. And then on the west side, um, a fair amount of offsite area that crosses the roadway, um, ultimately um, recommending cross culverts to maintain that conveyance capacity. There's also an option to construct the road at um, grade to allow the sheet flow to continue over it. There's, there's pros and cons of both. Um, but the road is currently within the effective um, floodplain in that area. Um, so, so we looked in detail at what some of the flow paths were and, and did some uh, cross sections uh, through LIDAR to be um, certain about some of the offsite area and also the drainage area divides. Um, in some cases, you can see it looks like we've got a huge hill out there. Uh, for, for those of you who are here from the hill country, it's not that big, but it does have um, some elevation relief. Um, so we looked at where should the drainage area divide be set. It was um, preliminary set, preliminarily set at um, the neighbor's parkway crossing, um, but we determined we could actually move it um, you know, uh, west or east, um, depending on the needs and still achieve the outfall. But the um, roadway um, for sure was going to have to drain partially to M124 and partially to M125. The tricky part was that the uh, watershed divide had most of the area draining to M124, but obviously all of that area can't get back to M124. So we had to really look at balancing out peak flows. Um, we looked at a few different um, cross sections um, from the uh, from the county's requirements. Uh, traditional cross section with with storm sewer system, uh, an LID feature within the median uh, of the roadway um, because the right of way is <coughs> adequate to accommodate it, and also an LID feature uh, alongside the edge of the right of way. And these are typical sections that they like to look at in, in terms of alternatives. Um, so the county, uh, Harris County, is doing um, some of these roadways using low impact development to, uh, to mitigate it. Um, there's probably other consultants here who, who have worked with them on it as well. Um, and then some very um, conceptual planning level cost estimates uh, of prices. Um, basically, and there were different alternatives of how are we going to handle all of this off-site flow. But basically, alternatives two and three were the LID alternatives. And regardless of 
uh, off-site flow uh, methodology uh, came in at lower costs. These were not based on any kind of bids. This was just high uh, planning level to make sure moving forward with LID would be cost effective. Um, so, so once um, we got into the modeling, it was a bit of an iterative process of balancing where the drainage area divide would be and making sure impacts to both streams uh, were mitigated. Um, so we had an alternative where we just looked at, um, and we'll call them M124 and M125. M125 um, was able to be uh, mitigated uh, using a lot of bioretention because it's fairly flat. So bioretention, meaning that it's going to allow more ponding, some infiltration, um, will tend to have better hydrologic results than vegetated swells, which are going to be sloped and provide a little bit more conveyance. So the M125 area was pretty flat, so we could fit a lot of bioretention in there. And we found that we needed about 75% of the length covered with bioretention and 25% of the length with vegetated swell. Uh, on M124, um, that's the area that had some pretty steep slopes. Um, so it's difficult to get a flat bottom bioretention when we've got a 1%, 2% plus slope. So that had to be really dominated by uh, vegetated swell or at least a large portion. So we looked at two alternatives. The first one was, well, what if we just do all vegetated swell? Will that mitigate it? So it didn't get us there. Uh, but we also knew that we had reserved capacity in the regional detention basin if needed to mitigate part of the road. And then we said, well, let's see how much bioretention we need um, to be able to mitigate it within the right of way. And so that's about a 45-55% um, uh, split. Uh, so vegetated swell, um, you know, dominated by vegetative processes. We've got water quality benefits, pollutant removal, uh, the bioretention still, um, you know, large and lengthy within the uh, right of way, uh, but more of a flat infiltration um, based system. Um, the, the soils are uh, sandy clay, uh, which really means low infiltration rate, low saturated hydraulic conductivity. It's not as low as, as a lot of projects we've done, but it's still still low. I think like maybe we'll get to it. I think maybe like 0.1 inch per hour. Um, so we have an underdrain in the system. All right, so this exhibit just shows um, basically how the flow is handled in different areas. So we have off-site flow potentially being handled by cross culverts or by not uh, elevating that portion of the right-of-way. Uh, we've got LID draining to an outfall. We've got a drainage area divide here draining back to the outfall with LID. Uh, then we've got this is still within the M124 system, but it's not able to flow back upstream. So it's either outfalling to an existing wetland or outfalling to the regional detention basin, which is in that M124 watershed. And then we have a drainage area divide where both sides uh, drain directly to the M125 channel. Um, so these graphics just basically illustrate where we would have vegetated swell um, versus bioretention. So just an idea uh, on the split. All right, so project constraints were um, fairly significant. We had off-site flows, many concurrent projects, not only within the uh, watershed, but really pretty adjacent and on top of each other. Uh, a lot of timing and schedule issues. Um, there was a fairly mature tree that the um, uh, county and the commissioner uh, wanted protected, so it meant that we had to not have any LID features too close to it, uh, so it factored into um, drainage area divides. Uh, rainfall depths uh, in Harris County, um, starting with the two-year of four inches and the hundred-year of just over um, 12 inches. Uh, saturated hydraulic conductivity, 0.145 inch per hour. So that's not exactly the same as infiltration, but it's the driving um, factor in infiltration rates. So our hydrology methods, and this was all uh, modeled and documented, our hydrology methods included the Clark unit hydrograph method, which is uh, the typically used method in the area, uh, with time of concentration estimated um, using the uplands velocity method. Um, peak runoff rates uh, were required um, by the flood control district to be 
estimated using the rational method uh, because it's a roadway project that uh, is assumed to um, increase conveyance. Um, so um, unfortunately, that method tends to um, increase peak flows or, or generate higher peak flows than certain other methods, um, but that's what we had to work with. Um, the right of way uh, is assumed to be 100% impervious cover. That's not really the case, but that's um, county uh, criteria. And in the uh, two year event, some capacity in the drainage system has to be provided for um, strips alongside the road of way, road uh, right of way, so as other areas develop, they have a um, drainage outfall. They don't have to be mitigated, but they have to be accommodated. Um, so there's a gravel road across an existing um, detention basin, and that's where the right of way falls. Um, but otherwise, the project area is considered undeveloped. Uh, so our peak flows, this is without the LID um, increase. And you might wonder, well, why is the two-year higher than the 10-year and the 100-year? And that's because the two-year <coughs> includes um, off-site uh, areas that drainage has to be accommodated for. Um, but you can see we increase um, pretty substantially between existing and proposed. Um, so we use the EPA SWIM model uh, for all of the LID modeling, uh, which accounts for um, detailed processes through the system. In this case, uh, we neglected evapotranspiration uh, because these are design storm events um, just being run uh, for a few days as opposed to a long-term continuous simulation model, in which case we would use uh, evapotranspiration. Uh, but all of the other processes are accounted for. We've got um, the drain rock layer, the underdrain, some infiltration into the native <coughs> soil, and then runoff through the underdrain. <coughs> All right, so our hydrographs um, from each drainage area, uh, basically uh, M124 had uh, two alternatives. Uh, one alternative was all uh, vegetated swill, knowing we'd have to make up some capacity in the regional detention. Alternative two fully mitigates it within the right of way. Uh, and that's the case. Well, the two-year event actually didn't have to be mitigated because the two-year peak flows include area beyond um, the road right-of-way, so it's not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, but we have, have it in here um, for reference. Uh, but the 10-year uh, and the 100-year um, both being fully mitigated. And then in M125, it's just one alternative um, showing the events mitigated. Now, there's a double peak. Uh, in here, and that's because of um, discharge from the uh, vegetated swell followed by peak discharge from the bioretention under drain system. Uh, we can look at uh, levels or depths within the LID features. So we, here we have the vegetated swells uh, within um, the M124 system, and it's for both alternatives, but you can just get a sense that it's a 24-hour design storm event, it's filling up fairly quickly, and it's draining out relatively quickly uh, at about 42 hours. So these swells have some bottom slope, they're conveying flows, we get some settling of pollutants, suspended solids, and bound um, pollutants like metals, uh, but they are reducing um, the uh, peak flows. They're providing some hydrologic lagging. Uh, the bioretention, on the other hand, you can see it's providing more detention, uh, more storage, significantly more lagging. Um, uh, there's, you don't see a hydrograph here, but you'd see uh, more hydrograph uh, attenuation. Uh, so this is also for both alternatives. We've got the surface storage and then we've got the um, drain rock storage. So it gets fairly deep in the uh, larger, um, actually the two-year gets deeper than the 10-year again because it's accommodating off-site um, flows uh, in that analysis, but uh, it, gets, it gets fairly deep, so it's important that the uh, plants be selected um, to be able to withstand that in the uh, design storm event. Now those are more extreme events. It's not going to happen every day or, or every week, uh, but it still needs to be uh, looked at. Uh, then we can look at the M125 system, uh, our vegetated swell hydrographs functioning similarly. Uh, Bioretention, uh, also similar, but drains out just a little bit um, quicker. So our drain down time for the 100-year event um, from the maximum storage level is about uh, 36 hours, maybe. Uh, we can look at the water budget summaries. 
uh, but essentially showing that for the 10 year and the 100 year events, uh, the peak flows uh, are mitigated uh, back to existing conditions. Now, M124 alternative one, though, is higher than existing, and that's because it includes some detention in the regional basin. Uh, we could also um, look at volume uh, as well. I don't think we have total volume on here, but, but we could look at that. Uh, the M125 system, again, there's some increase in the two-year, and that's because there's uh, additional area incorporated in proposed conditions just to provide off-site capacity. But the 10-year and the 100-year um, being mitigated back to existing conditions. Uh, so this is um, just what the uh, features look like. Um, they're all trapezoidal, kind of a similar look, although the uh, vegetated swell will have you know, different types of plantings and the bioretention. Uh, we've assumed fairly dense plantings uh, for our mannings in value. All right, and then we also have floodplain fill um, issues, and that's been separated into um, both watersheds, although M125 is not a studied stream, so any floodplain fill within that watershed actually is within uh, the Willow Creek, which is the main um, stream watershed. Um, initially, we looked at elevating the entire roadway above the 100-year um, floodplain, and that was a lot of floodplain fill. Um, so the current, the current plan is one lane, one travel lane in each direction above the 25-year water surface elevation. But there are moving parts because the M124 channel improvements when constructed are basically bringing uh, the 100-year into the channel. So um, there's still a few things in flux. Uh, the other option to not have any floodplain storage um, fill uh, mitigation volume is to keep the road uh, at existing natural ground. But there is a um, strong desire by the county uh, to be able to have access to uh, a county um, service center and pub public uh, facility that's being built. Um, this just actually came up in a meeting yesterday, and I thought, well, we're at a floodplain management conference. I should, should throw it in here. Um, but the um, floodway, which is just a real light, different textured shade, actually clips the edge or clips over uh, Paul Reef Road in the middle of the regional detention basin. So it will be easier um, to place fill there if that's not in, not in the uh, floodway, if it's just in the floodplain. Um, so we just looked at, well, what are the existing surcharges uh, in the flood, floodway model? And right at that location, it's 0.89 feet. Um, just upstream, it's 0.96, and just downstream, it's like 0.83. Um, so we did, we did a quick trial, and we said, well, if we brought that floodway back to the edge, southern edge of the road right of way or, or let's take it 20 feet beyond that um, what does that do with the flood wage uh, surcharge values and it's still below a foot so we need to make sure it doesn't affect uh, other adjacent or upstream uh, cross sections as well uh, but it looks like that may be a separate FEMA submittal obviously all the channel improvements and floodplain fill that we're talking about uh, will require um, a fairly extensive um, loamer um, so there's two streams within the project, M124 and M125. The lower reaches are really um, dominated by backwater um, from Willow Creek. Um, M125 was not a studied stream, although we were able to get a HECRAS uh, model from the flood control district that they used in um, designing uh, M125. Uh, and then the M125 watershed area was modeled as a single sub area in the effective model. So we, we broke that up. Uh, we went into more detail on the drainage area parameters, uh, distributed the flows, uh, did some um, storage outflow routing uh, using the modified pulse method, and came up with um, an improved M125 model. Now, interestingly, the model showed in a normal depth run which it's not a FEMA studied stream, um, and the criteria is to use normal depth. In the normal depth run, there was a lot of capacity in that system. So theoretically, we could increase flows, raise the water surface elevation, and call it not an adverse impact. 
But in practical purposes, when we assign um, backwater as a starting water surface, the, wa the floodplain's all over the place, we increase flows, and the all over place gets up just a little bit more. So um, at one point there was hope that there might be capacity in that stream, but it looks like it's pretty, uh, pretty maxed out. Um, so anyway, um, kind of a typical impact analysis, um, uh, looking at uh, um, crossing uh, within the stream and different sizes of crossings. The smaller one we initially had in did increase the water surface, again, in normal depth that was within the stream. So we said, well, not an adverse impact, but uh, considering backwater, uh, it's out of banks. And so we had to go with a little bit um, larger uh, crossing to uh, not increase um, the 1% water surface. Uh, so it's just a typical trapezoidal channel. It's um, had some sedimentation over time, uh, but it was just built as a trapezoidal channel. Uh, here's what the crossing uh, will look like. Okay, a few final thoughts. Um, low impact development uh, can be very flexible to meet your particular project needs. Uh, while not a um, detailed requirement on this project, it is providing some water quality benefits, but it's really being used primarily um, as a flood control or a detention type measure. Now, these are not teeny tiny um, rain gardens that are a foot deep. These are pretty large facilities within the road um, median right of way. Um, they're like 4.3 feet deep at the maximum. Now, they're not always filling with 4.3 feet of water. Um, they are, some portions of them are filling up, uh, like you would see with a large roadside ditch. Some portions of them are only filling up to say a couple feet, depending on the contributing area. So the vegetation selection, it's just um, gone into the design process. The vegetation selection, I think, will be really um, critical in terms of looking at those inundation limits and, and putting in plants in appropriate areas that can withstand um, various levels of inundation. Um, bioretention and vegetated swells are both really ideal LID features for transportation projects, uh, both for ro roadways and for parking lots. I uh, appreciate your uh, attendance and participation and would love to answer any questions.